looks like we are live again. Today is September 3rd, 2017, and here we are for another season of Calcedon Questions and Answers. I'm Martin Sobretti, the Vice President of the Calcedon Foundation. We have a few questions that came in uh, in the email. Some of these came from uh, class participants in an Institutes of Biblical Law class that Andrea Schwartz uh, conducts. And we'll probably start with these first. Uh, and then we can move to any uh, subsequent questions that are uh, brewing in your minds out there. And that these might even trigger some additional questions. There's four of these. First one. Is it presumptuous to put out a call for prayer and tell people how to pray? For example, to pray for a specific or very specific outcome. That's an interesting question because, of course, the Lord's Prayer itself in Matthew 6 does pray for specifics, uh, very clear specifics. Uh, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It isn't as, is about as specific as you can get. So there's nothing inherently presumptuous about a specific request. I think the presumption arises when you pray for something that conflicts with the will of God. We pray for this woman to have a safe abortion. That would be extreme presumption to try to get God on the side of a, of a murder. So I think the issue here is really is after or according to the will of God that the petition is being laid up. And of course God reserves the right to uh, answer the prayers he sees fit. Yes, no, or postponing an answer to it. We never know his seasons and why he uh, waits. In fact, this raises an interesting point in uh, Psalm, I think it's 11. Let me check its first four if I can grab that real quick. just came to mind as we're talking about this. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, verse 4 of Psalm 11. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. It's that verse... His eyelids try the children of men. What does that mean? Well, it's when God closes his eyes, or seems to close his eyes at us. And it appears that he's not listening or hearing uh, or seeing what we're doing. He closes his eyelids. It looks like he's not responding. And so the way to test is he tries the children of men by not answering our prayers or our calls for assistance. He tests us. So... He beholds us with his eyes, but he can also test us with his eyelids. It's a pro very profound verse there in Psalm 11, verse 4. And if this is the case, we can't say that an answer or a failed answer to prayer reflects presumption on our part. It could be that we are being tested and tried. Tried as uh, silver in the furnace, if you will. Uh, God reserves the right to use his eyelids in this way, and Psalm 11, 4 makes it very clear. Most people are familiar with the preceding verse 3 which I believe is about if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? But here we have, obviously, a connection that God tests us with his eyelids, with apparently closing his eyes to our troubles and our strife. So, again, answer to the question is, it depends on whether the petition being prayed for is legitimately uh, pro-kingdom or if it is uh, a prayer for justice to fail in some uh, area or respect. Second question that came in, could you address the concept that God loves us unconditionally? Isn't the condition Calvary appropriated to God's elect? So I think the question then show, uh, <clears throat> gets off the ground because of some ambiguities uh, and some missteps in our logic. Because what we're talking about here is the entire notion of what's possible. And in the Christian theistic worldview, possibility is itself framed and delimited by God. So certain things are not going to be possible simply because God has not ruled. Now, for God, all things are possible, but for men, they are not. And when God ordains an end, he also ordains the means to the end. So if he is looking uh, forward to our uh, glorification at the tail end of time, then the means along the way that is, are also ordained by God. So he can uh, restrain evil in us. That's part of the purpose of the Holy Spirit in us. There's that very famous phrase, probably misunderstood as most are in the scripture, in James 4 verse 5. Do you think that the scripture is empty when it says that the Holy Spirit uh, lusteth uh, in us, lusteth to envy? In other words, is working overtime to try to straighten us out and sees that we're squandering our love and our affections on the things of this world instead of on the things of God. So there's a war within us, and uh, it's a war that for the elect will be won, 
by uh, God's Spirit over us. So the question of whether or not you are elect, uh, and that raises other questions entirely. So uh, when God has an unconditional love, he will see that love through every aspect. So what is going to be possible for that person to go through is also restricted. It's not wide open. And I can you cannot go with Luther's position, well, if I uh, kill and murder uh, a thousand times a day, I can't separate me from the love of God. Well, uh, like some, Mercedoni, I think, said with... Uh, Saints like this, who need sinners, if it's okay to murder a thousand times a day. Uh, obviously, Luther was making a point, but uh, the point can be easily mis misunderstood because God is not going to have his Christians go out murdering and then say, it's okay, and my love was unconditional. He's going to frame their lives very, very differently so that the fruit of the Spirit is in evidence, a topic that we've discussed in the last two Q&A sessions. So, I think that covers the whole point. God's love is unconditional, but that does not mean that no matter what you do, uh, he's going to keep loving you. Because this is a, that misunderstands the whole concept of possibility. Possibility is itself not some abstract out there that God has to also deal with. Oh my gosh, there's a possibility that I don't see coming. Rather, all things in the universe are uh, controlled by a single overarching decree by God. And he's in control of everything. So there's nothing that takes him by surprise. And so there's no such thing as some hypothetical thing. In fact, that's why we talked about the category of heretical hypotheticals. That is, you raise up an if, uh, and then you say, now given this if, which is a abstraction, this hypothesis, uh, you try to draw inferences from it. And this can get you into big trouble fast. It got Job's three friends into big trouble to the point that God says, you better ask Job to pray for you and I will, I will listen to Job, my servant Job, but not to you, because you've spoken wrongly concerning me. God takes it pretty seriously. Uh, the same thing happened, we mentioned it last week, when the disciples want to know who was uh, sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Uh, we have false ideas, and they do not reflect how God actually operates in the real world. The third question, it's a little tougher one here, the prison system is not biblical. What interim steps can be made to begin to remedy this situation? So sometimes when we answer these questions, we can give a full bore, here's the answer all laid out and complete. Other times what we can do is sketch out the foundations for an answer that's still in development because Christians have been asleep at the switch for too long and have not been developing the principle of general equity. They talk big about general equity, but don't actually do it don't actually apply, take God's law, and then apply it to our current situations. And that's why when we drift so far off our Christian autopilot as a nation, uh, it takes a lot of imagination to see how do we resolve this issue. Rush Dooney made this point in uh, chapter, the third volume of uh, Institutes of Biblical Law, The Intent of the Law, a very short sentence. He says, we have an obligation, this is in the context that says, when we get such an evil state, so the government, we have an obligation to work for justice by prayerfully working to restore all men and institutions to the rightful place under God in his Christ. That's on page 32. He's talking about the appellate courts. And the whole principle of appeals is that there's a, something, a flaw in the lower levels than what has actually happened nowadays. <laughs> and it's reflected in our prison system, which is a corollary of the court system. It's a part and parcel of it. Is that uh, the only reason that you can overturn and a lower court is on a procedural matter. It is regarded as infallible on the matter of justice. And the Bible sees this very differently. It has an entire appellate system because human beings do courts and justice, and they tend to not deliver justice. And so the entire prison system is of like uh, fabric here. So Rushdie gave us at least a framework here. You need to continue to work. Now let's talk about this. What can be done in the interim, and that's the position placed here, uh, several things come to mind. If the biblical categories would be capital crimes or restitution, then if people are in prison for some other reason than these two, it seems to me that we, are, we have to then move in terms of uh, getting them out of prison, that those should not have been actionable uh, crimes in any uh, shape or form. Um, and, and Gordon, I have not yet studied that uh, Nashville statement. I see it all over the Facebook uh, threads, and I've been busy with other things, but I intend to take a look at it because it bears a lot of heat. Uh, but I certainly will answer that question next week. Uh, when we, can we uh, but I'll be glad to take that up because it seems to be a hot spot right now. I just not have had the time to see exactly what, what came forth, other than there's 
uh, an obviously large amount of friction about that. So I'd like to shed light on it, and I can't shed light on it without studying it first and uh, assessing where they went right and where they went wrong. It might be all of one or the other. We'll see when I take a look. But I appreciate you bringing that to my attention because it is all the buzz. So again, about the biblical prison system, or rather prison systems versus a biblical system, uh, you certainly can start by saying uh, we can reduce the footprint of the biblical violations if we stop in jailing people for crimes that don't involve restitution and or uh, capital crimes. Because the proper response to those two categories is they make restitution or uh, they have to pay for their life for what they've done, a murder, a man stealing, and things on this order. So that's where we have to go. Uh, and so that would be a, a pretty smart first step because what happens is the prison system is one of the gears of the great big wheel of death. If you look at my articles on the op opioid addiction crisis, uh, I think it's the 10th or 11th article in the series, I showed all these gears showing that there is in fact a gigantic economic system that has arisen, goes full circle back to feeding into the uh, uh, opioid addiction crisis. And one of the wheels, of course, is the what we call the prison industrial complex, the corrections industry, and the amount of money that it makes uh, using the labor of the people there. And there's a very little intention of folks not um, making money with this system. They figure out a way to uh, cap make capital uh, out of this violation of biblical law. So until such time as that is undercut, uh, there is a profit motive an evil one, uh, to continue to persist the existing prison systems that we have. And so, and of course that feeds into more of the same things. Uh, you want to then keep up your supply, and one way to keep up supply of prisoners is to continue to uh, add more laws to the books. Remember, a biblical law at maximum has 613 laws, most of which applied to a temple system that has uh, since been set aside uh, due to the sacrifice of Christ. And all the ones that remain uh, are very clear pieces of law that provide case applications for our, our situation today. And they are sufficient uh, for everything that we need. So when humanistic law multiplies all its laws, it's attempting to create its perfect society by means of regulation, government control. We see this right now in the uh, earthquake relief efforts in the Houston area, New Orleans, all this stuff. Because when FEMA comes in, they don't want to have the private volunteers going out rescuing on their airboats and what have you. So they're being told to stand down and to leave and leave it to the, the experts. Notwithstanding how many hundreds of people were already saved by private ex uh, help, under socialism, you don't want to have private assistance. And as Rushdoony pointed out in the Soviet Union in before '89, you, know, you could get in big trouble for aiding a neighbor in need because that meant that the source of all good wasn't the state anymore; it was the, your fellow individual. And it was true that in some communist nations, like this, ultra-socialist nations, they would plant people and ask for help. And if you provided them, it was a sting and you could be jailed for providing assistance to people. And only the state alone is the savior. You may not help your fellow man. And so the prison system is all of a piece with this entire situation. But as far as an interim solution, I would think that the decriminalizing of certain things that are not biblical crimes would be a good place to start, insofar as at least you would start to shrink, and then the monetary incentive for the system would be undercut. And once that pillar is collapsed out from under the prison system, the rest of it is going to fall pretty fast. They're going to suddenly be much more interested in uh, maybe restitution makes sense, biblical restitution. But of course then the state has to acknowledge a source of law higher than itself. And that it's not willing to do. Not willing to do. So it's an uphill battle. The fourth question is very interesting to me, the fourth and last one that came in in advance. What is a modern application of the cities of refuge in that the death of the high priest is no longer applicable since Jesus is our great high priest. So let's talk about these cities of refuge. When Rashtuni spoke about these, he uh, dealt with them uh, in his commentary on Numbers, on the 35th chapter, and then at greater length in Deuteronomy 19. And when he got around to the Deuteronomy 19 passage, he said, we must look at where the core of the law is. The core of the law is in uh, cities of refuge is Deuteronomy 19, verses 9 and 10. 
which he reads, If thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, and to walk ever in his ways, then shalt thou add three cities more for thee besides these first three. That innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. So the whole point here is that innocent blood not be shed. That's the entire purpose of the cities of refuge, the Levitical cities. They were given three, and then they were to get an additional three if they uh, received the blessings of the additional land and walked according to God's paths. So six would have been set aside of the 48 Levitical cities, which, by the way, as Rishwani pointed out, the Levitical cities were not militaristic um, citadels at all. They were fortresses for intellectual defense of the faith. It's a very profound point. But one of the things beyond intellectual defense was to prevent the shedding of innocent blood through vendettas and feuds and blood oaths and things in this order. That innocent blood, the slayer, the manslayer, which means not a murderer, but rather someone guilty of manslaughter. That man is morally free, as Rashtuni points out, but there's a legal fact of a death. And sometimes the kinsman redeemer, if another family member says, well, I'm going to avenge you, uh, at the, you know, they cry and wail and say, I'm going to get the guy whose axe head fell off and slayed you. That's the example that scripture lays out. An accidental death where there was no intent. So he did not hate him in his heart before. It just happened all of a sudden you know, by accident, if you will, manslaughter. And so it was designed to block uh, the shedding of innocent blood, and the particular example given was of manslaughter. I don't think we need to limit it to that. I think there's any case where innocent blood is going to be shed on account of wrath or vendettas or feuds, uh, honor killings, uh, things on this order that uh, seem to occur in some cultures that... Uh, put honor, a face culture that puts honor so far up that it, uh, it takes a turn for the worse, a harmful turn uh, against the innocent blood, then by all means the Levitical city principle seems to be alive and well. And this is for several reasons. One, Levites. What can you tell me about the Levite? What we should notice first is that one of the promises that follow the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31 arises two chapters over in Jeremiah 33, where God says, I will multiply the uh, Levites as the sands of the sea. Well, that's quite an, an achievement to say, Levites, anywhere you look, Levites. Wow. That's a promise that occurs toward the end of the church age, as more and more folks become kings and priests under God, as Revelation 1, 5, and 6 tells us. And it's a thought also captured by Peter when he's quoting from uh, Exodus 19. But even more to the point is a passage at the tail end of Isaiah, in the 66th chapter of Isaiah. I believe it's verse 21. Last week we actually were talking at length about verse 23, ironically, and now we come right back to the tail end of Isaiah 66. And here's the passage. The context is about the Gentiles that were referred to several verses before, repeatedly. And therefore, when he says, I will take of them, this is God speaking, some, I will take of the Gentiles. And I will take also of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. So one of the ways that God multiplies all the Levites as a sound of the sea of numbers is that he raises up Gentiles and turns them into Levites and priests unto him. So, you know, welcome, Roberto. So that's the premise here, is that uh, Gentiles become Levites and priests. So the function, far from being uh, cut off and shrunk, is expanded to the entire church. Verse 20 points out when he discusses the cities of refuge that the uh, churches for most of the uh, church age have been re uh, regarded as cities of refuge in themselves. In fact, I think he points out in the British Isles, uh, if a, someone guilty of manslaughter was fleeing to a church, that he could even stop at crosses on the way and those would protect him, all, and was acknowledged as protection, but prior to getting to the church where he would stay as a sanctuary, uh, so that innocent blood, his blood in this case, would not be shed by an angry uh, kinsman, who was hot, as they say. His reason has left him, and he says, I don't care how brother, my brother died, I'm going to avenge him of it. It doesn't matter if he's innocent or not. Someone's going to pay for the loss that I'm feeling, the pain I'm feeling. Not recognizing that in a fallen world, things like this can happen. In man manslaughter, God does not give us the authority uh, under Mosaic law to uh, take a someone's life who simply an accidental death has occurred on their watch. Uh, 
there would have to be culpability, and uh, that has not been established. So the uh, cities of refuge concept, where should we, f we should be looking for places where innocent blood is being shed, and therefore we should expand the concept of a city of refuge so that any facility or place or home can become a refuge that would protect someone from the spilling of innocent blood. We might consider applying this to the entire abortion question. Maybe we can go ahead and offer that kind of help and say, we'll take you in, we have a place, and we'll see you all the way through and get you up and running. So one of the big complaints about the uh, pro-life group on the other side is, well, you're big on not killing the baby, but once the baby's born, now what? You didn't offer any neonatal help, you didn't offer any postnatal help, uh, it's a lot of talk, and now someone has got an obligation. So what are you doing to help? Well, of course, this is not true. There are plenty of Christians that are assisting uh, the crisis pregnancy scenario, but we could make it more explicit than we have, and we should actually work in terms of that refuge concept. Rather than just considering it something of the past, we should say it has a place today because innocent blood is still being shed. And consequently, uh, we should expand the range of these uh, fortresses for the intellectual defense of the faith and for uh, sanctuary protection of, of innocent blood uh, for whatever reason that might be. So these are the ways we can go. Now, one of the questions that was raised by my uh, interlocutor here is that uh, you, someone who fled to a city of refuge, they were protected by law uh, as long, uh, and, but if they were to leave prior to the death of the high priest, they were fair game for the angry kinsmen to go after. Uh, this is kind of a little bit of a limited concept, but it, nonetheless it says that he needs to stay there until the death of the high priest. After that, he can leave and he's protected. So now we have to then ask, what does this restriction, this, this temporal restriction, have to do with today? And he raises the question, isn't Jesus our high priest? We don't really have the equivalent of a high priest here, do we? What's well, <coughs> occurring here is a change of jurisdiction between each of the high priests uh, as they came into play. And there could have been two ways to go about it. One is that once you knew that the man who sought your life <coughs> was dead, uh, obviously, be, or the family is no, no longer upset, or you could have the equivalent of a reconciliation that was mediated. After all, unto us is given the ministry of reconciliation, to it that God is in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself. That can be done, then ambassadors for reconciliation can deal with this issue too. So uh, we have to then take a look at what is the consequence of not having this temporal time gap, this escape switch here every so often. Uh, I think it needs to then be upon us to say that since the goal or purpose is uh, twofold, one, shedding of instant blood. Second, we have to realize that these people feared God. No one decided, I'm going to go into the Levitical city with a sword anyway and take the man out. They feared God enough not to step foot in there angry and say, okay, well, they're beyond my reach now. Modern man doesn't see it this way. This brings us to an interesting passage in Rush Dooney's book, The uh, Christianity in the State, chapter on extraterritoriality. There's a mouthful, easy to mess up that word, extraterritoriality. I'm not going to try to say it three times fast. It has to do with a plot of land which is like an enclave. It's inside your property, inside your national, national land, but the complete control of it is someone else's, namely it's an embassy. Ambassadors have immunities in that plot of land. It's as if it's a part of their own land in the middle of your land. And so the cities of refuge, which were distributed throughout Israel, were essentially extraterritorial. They were God, where God ruled through the Levites and through the law of God. And consequently, uh, it was a safe haven. You could not go in there and penetrate it. it they, you had uh, am ambassadorial protections or immunities. I don't want to use the word diplomatic because that brings in 20th and 21st century thinking, which is all about power politics, which scripture is absolutely opposed to. Nonetheless, there's a fundamental principle that within this place there is an immunity because you're on different territory now. This land is God's land. This city is God's city. And, you, and if the city has ruled that you were a, a merely a man's slayer and not a murderer, just a, a manslaughter, accidental death that occurred at your hand, uh, then they would, you would have their protection. Nowadays, we don't seem to get this protection. When Rashtuni talked about extraterritoriality, 
he had written the book in such a time frame that he could mention what happened under Carter in Iran when the embassy was overrun. They did not uh, assume any diplomatic immunity on the part of the Americans there. In our own day, there's a big way and cry over Benghazi. Hey, this was an embassy. It got overrun. The immunities there were lost. Uh-oh. Uh big trouble, big problem, and uh, people crying for um, liability and responsibility. Who's responsible for the fact? Well, among other things, there was no fear of either God or the United States in the eyes of those who overran these various embassies. So the protections that are supposed to be mutual uh, are, are long gone. They've been shot. And they're dead. So the whole principle of extraterritoriality also has to be applied. If there's no fear of God, then, of course, the state's going to say, we can go in there and, and take down a church. And so we see how far removed are we are from our own foundations. Again, back to Psalm 11, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, you're back to Isaiah 58, 12. You have to build new foundations. And it's the hard work. We always say that. So that's the, that's the issue there. So I think we don't want to take a talk about the temporal uh, uh, component, um, which is tied again to the original Levitical thing, but say now is the time to expand on this notion uh, in regard to uh, um, the ap application of the cities of refuge. How can we have more cities of refuge in their modern New Covenant embodiment to make sure that innocent blood is not shed and in keeping with the various principles that are there? I think we can expand the concept uh, and work in terms of the ministry of reconciliation, especially since that reconciliation is a ministry that is given to every single one of us. No one is exempt from it. Uh, this is the way that Paul lays it out in 2 Corinthians 5, 17-20. Unto us is given the ministry of reconciliation, uh, because God is reconciling all things to himself through Christ. And so we're part of that process. So it seems to me that the need for this time lapse is no longer needed as a consequence of the new covenant form of the cities of refuge, which again is an area that has to be explored. We have to talk about the extraterritoriality of it, the immunities that it enjoys, etc., etc., now, it's interesting to me that Scripture talks about immunities here in regard to cities of refuge, and the modern state talks about immunities for, say, law enforcement officers. Uh, what happens, of course, is that whatever you immunize uh, becomes a potential avenue for tyranny, because if I'm given power and now I'm immune from uh, being called on the carpet for abuse of the power, except unless it's a violation of a policy versus actual justice. Remember what Rushton you said about procedure versus actual justice? You can get in trouble for a procedural problem, but not for actually being unjust to your neighbor. As long as you follow the policy, it's okay. So until we reverse that, we have another problem. But the point is, the Scripture does talk about immunities, but one of the immunities that we are supposed to have under Scripture is the immunity of the innocent. If you're innocent, you cannot be uh, guilty of something on the fundamental grounds that you're innocent. But under social justice theory, everyone's categorized by groups. And so no individual can be innocent if he belongs to a group. The group shares all the guilt. And whether you're individually innocent of anything or uh, that your group is charged with or not is irrelevant. You're a member of the group. So these immunities are thrown away uh, and under a social justice scenario. And when you start to throw away biblical immunities in favor of building your new socialist utopia, then you're going to substitute other immunities, like the immunity of law enforcement, so that they are not having the same law for them as for the citizen. We have the same principle in Congress, right? They don't have the same laws that apply to us don't apply to our representatives in the Senate and the Congress. They don't have to do A, B, and C that we're required to do. And it's considered controversial whenever a congressman says, I'm going to introduce a piece of legislation that says we're on the same footing as the citizens we rule. And then the scream goes up from there. Okay. Let's see. And Roberto, I was glad to answer that question about the uh, Christian identity issue. Brian Edwards asks, Last week you spoke of the use of wine and grape juice for communion. Does the Bible limit it there, or can any liquid be substituted? That's a very interesting question, because I think the premise is a, it's supposed to be, obviously, the blood of grapes. Whether, and so the, the grape is being bled, if you will, and represents blood. Uh, and the bread and the body. Uh, that's uh, You grind up the uh, wheat and bake the bread. And so it's by the same token that we make a loaf of bread 
from the wheat, God made the human bodies from the dust of the ground, and the grape has its blood. So there's symbolism present there. So we'll just wind back a little bit to the modes of, I'm going to take a little different topic to get around to this question. Uh, baptism. Is it possible to baptize without water? The early church held that if there was no water around and someone was dying, you could baptize them with sand. Warfield brings this up in his studies of the modes of, uh, of baptism. Now that's kind of stunning to think about that. If you can substitute sand for water on the grounds that there is no sand or, or water, and sand is all you have, then I will baptize thee uh, because it's a symbol of something else. It's it's uh, if you are saying the form of the symbol is all that matters. Then you can have empty formalism, right? Here they're saying the entire uh, rite is done correctly except that the one element is out of kilter because it's not available. God has not seen fit to provide water here in the desert where all there is is sand to baptize with. So, can you substitute other things for a grape or a grape juice? Particularly, let's say, if someone's allerg deathly allergic to grape juice. And it can happen. I know this not because I'm allergic to grape juice, but I'm allergic to honey. And that's a problem because there's actually a verse that commands, eat thou honey. And if I eat that, I'm in big trouble, seriously trouble. So the issue there is, um, what is the intent behind the symbol? And it's really, I think, we have to go to Jude. Now, Jude looks like it's obscure when he mentions this notion of the love feast, but that's because we want it to be obscure. Oftentimes when the scriptures give us something that tells us what this is about, uh, if it doesn't fit our models, we get cognitive dissonance and we evade it or say, well, that's some other feast. It's got nothing to do with uh, communion. But that's a big, big stretch to me. Uh, it doesn't fit the whole notion of everyone coming together and having a feast in love, agape love. It's an agape feast. And it's the love of Christ that's being shed abroad. And the feast is brings us together. It has a, a connotation with the feasts of the Old Testament not the least of which would be the feast during the poor tithe, which brings community together, and it's also a love feast. Uh, so, and, and people are showing their love by their support to one of another there as well, and their acknowledgement of being fellow brothers and sisters under Jehovah's watchful eye as a shepherd of Israel by way of eminence. So, uh, I, I cannot say that it's impossible that you could use something else in special cases, because, of course, Sand was used in lieu of water for baptism in special cases. Uh, and we have to take them on a case-by-case -case basis. This brings us to uh, what financial interests might be uh, at stake in some of these decision-making processes. The old uh, saying, qui bono, in Latin, who benefits, you know, follow the money kind of thing, is it that Welch's has uh, got a claim to make here in the interest of these things. We know that there was, for a time, uh, certain things were designed or named even to avoid uh, confrontation with biblical law uh, or with even, say, the prohibition of alcohol, things in this order. And so sometimes you have to wind back and take a look under the hood and say, uh, is there some other agenda at play here that's not as so innocent as at first glance might have we might have thought? So that'd be a place to go. Let's see, did I miss a question that paused up here? Bring the questions back. I just learned how to get rid of questions. That's not a good thing. I wanted to get the questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, Charles Roberts uh, has a uh, book on the topic of... Uh, Ted Wyland's ministry and the Christian identity uh, question. So if you want to post the link to that book, feel free to do that, Charles. Uh, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Race over grace, racialist Christian. You know, there was actually a um, issue of Faith for All of Life, and the uh, theme of it was the racialist heresy. And I would um, commend that to folks who have a general interest in this topic, too. A uh, basic idea here is that the, uh, the distinctions don't make any sense anymore when you actually look at various passages of Scripture. Uh, we spoke about one earlier in our discussion today already, that God uses uh, takes the Gentiles and makes them Levites and priests. Uh, and then the entire premise of Isaiah 19, 
where Israel is the third part in Egypt and Assyria come into God's kingdom prior to Israel coming in. That is uh, something. Uh, Roberto's objection, I think, is that the book was written in 2000. And, uh, oh yes, that, I'm not the book. I guess you mean the, the racialist heresy was done in 2000, which meant it was published while Rushdoney was still alive and had his sanction. So thank you for that, Chalcedon Foundation. <laughs> Roberto still has his original edition. I do too. We could form a club. Right. And the, yeah. Do you happen to have the link for that, uh, Charles, the lecture, the neglected lectures? If you do, feel free to post it. Maybe it's over on... I know that, Roberto. Um, I'm wondering if um, that Charles could find us that link. Uh, it's probably over at um, Pocket College, for all I know. So... Yeah, that's a dangerous position because now we're back to distinctions that the scriptures, actually in the Old Testament, knocked out. Lots of folks say, oh, well, you know, the Old Testament preserved all these things and it'll be preserved today. And the Old Testament preserved very little of what the people think it preserved. It actually self-delimited all these uh, institutional distinctions. And then it threw them under the bus. So it wasn't the New Testament that decided to chop, chop and snip, snip. Rather, it was the Old Testament that already said, hey, over here Moses said, you cannot be a priest if you're a eunuch. Over here in Isaiah 56, I will take eunuchs and turn them into priests. Uh-oh, what happened? Well, it's because none of those promises, none of those rules in, Mos in Moses could overthrow what was the principle laid out in the Abrahamic covenant. They could add to uh, them without subtracting anything. And so the prior covenant had the priority. And what we have is a restoration of God's law in it. Anything related to the cultists, the sacrificial system, had to give way. Most prominently, we talked about this, is the Ark of the Covenant. There's nothing more central as a part of the worship of old Israel than having the Ark of the Covenant there in your midst. God is here, the Shekinah glory, right here in our midst, in that temple or in that tabernacle. And what does Jeremiah 3.17 say? Bye-bye to it. It won't even come to mind anymore. The most essential part of Israeli worship, gone and no one misses it because it's no longer necessary. Uh, the same thing with the sacrificial system is blown out by the Messiah himself. He causes sacrifice and oblations to cease in Daniel 9.27 that he is Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah of uh, preceding verses. It is not this antichrist of the future. Jesus Christ is the one who causes sacrifice and oblations to cease in the middle of the week, three and a half years into his ministry, when he is cut off. And uh, that's the cause of the destruction of the sacrificial system. It has no more purpose at that point. Thank you. Tape number six. For those who still have cassette tapes, good news is the, we have them also on CDs, and I believe they're MP3 available on our website. Thanks for digging that up. You know, when I'm talking here, folks are busy on their keyboards tracking down resources for those. Because we see some of these um, Q&A sessions get 500, one of them 700 views, with most of the, half of those views well after it's no longer live, but it's gone. And uh, it's important to realize that you know, all the sources that you guys put up there that are legit, <laughs> assuming someone's a troll here and throws up something illicit, that would probably be purged out by one of our uh, administrators, uh, it's all of value and we appreciate the interaction. There's a limitation, of course, because I'm sitting in a small, well, big study here, uh, here in Georgetown, Texas, and other folks are all over the place uh, responding in course, and so it's kind of a interactive event here. Yes, there it is. We have it uh, available as an audio resource on our website, and it's in the Q&A time, Charles points out. So those who are interested in that topic, by all means, get to it. So I think I've come pretty close to exhausting the first four questions, and we've had uh, touched on the uh, the third one. Yeah, there it is, a case of mistaken identity. Uh, that's a good link. Thank you for that. Yeah, Harvey, we certainly were watching it as it hit, and we certainly had our fair share of wild rain and wind. And, um, up here in the north side of Austin. But we are quite some distance removed from the danger zone, so it was not a problem for us. Uh, unfortunately, one of my sons who lives in this, uh, within the larger loop of uh, loop eight of Houston also had no issues. 
And so we've been in prayer for those, uh, like Pastor Allison and Pastor Head, who uh, are in the midst of it and seem to be making it out there. There's Luke's as well. Good friends of Calcedon across the board in the Houston area. Uh, so far, no, no major crises. So that's always a thing. We talked about it last week, that God sealeth the hand of man using bad weather. It prevents us from doing the things we would otherwise, otherwise want to do because the weather makes it impossible. It's a break on us. God uses uh, nature uh, to do his will. As we mentioned last week, it's very rare to get passive phrases, theology about weather in Scripture. It's always God sent the rain, God sent the lightning to hit the mark. It was very rare to get a phrase, I think it was Amos 4-7, where it says, It raineth. Very rare to see a passive form, because God's hand is in everything. So, are there any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to end up going early, because the worst thing in a Q&A session is dead air. Because then I have to fill that dead air. And that's the worst thing for me. What if they had a Q&A session and no one asked any questions? And one possibility is this being our 11th Q&A session. We've covered all the controversial things. Last chance. Okay, so it looks like our admin is... Uh, going to get a little tough with you. Tough love on the Q&A session here. Uh, I do have this question from uh, Gordon concerning the Nashville statement. We'll touch that next week uh, and give a, a statement on that. So Roberto asks, I love the new publication by Kelsey on RJR's position papers. I'm very grateful for each of you at the Foundation. Good, Good Lord's Day to all. To you all. Well, we appreciate the, uh, the support on that and putting that big project out was a major task. Um, I was very glad for the shepherds and their involvement in, in that process, uh, Kyle and Shelby, without which it would not have been as, as, as strong a book as it is. It's something that we've been wanting to do for a long time for two reasons. One, the roots of Reconstruction, which it replaced, had no indices, and it was incomplete because it was published prior to uh, the final several years of Rashtuni's writings, and some were missed uh, even at that point. So we were able to complete the list and index it. Right, and there's more releases to come uh, that you may not know about that Calcedon will be publishing some unpublished Rush Tooney. Uh, one of which I'm involved in is the commentaries on First and Second Corinthians. Uh, I'm helping to fund those uh, those books, so that would be an exciting one. I believe uh, almost at the printers, if, if it may already be the printer, but it certainly is ready for printing would be the commentaries on Haggai, Zechariah, and Zephaniah. So uh, that should be coming up perhaps even at the end of this year. I'll have to check the printing schedule. Remember, Chalcedon operates debt-free. We owe no man anything, so every project has to be fully uh, funded and capitalized before it goes to the printer and gets marketed, and we pay our inventory taxes on that stuff, etc. C. Charles asks, Are there any plans to publish Mark's biographical series on RJR? The one from FFAOL. That's been talked about uh, because it would be singular. Now, there have other been other proposals that have come before us for individuals who would like to do a solid biography of Russ's John Rush Tooney. Uh, e. Ray Moore has a brother who is a noted biographer and has done some interesting work in this area. The trouble is that uh, though it would be outstanding work, we'd have to put the capital together for it. And that's a big deal, and actually would probably conflict with Rush's own position, which is get the important expositions of Scripture out first. Don't worry about me as a person. I'm not important. Kingdom of God's important. So we'd actually be going against our founder's wishes, if you will, by putting this out. On the other hand, no one else will, and no one else will certainly is likely to do a sympathetic biography, biographical statement on Dr. Rush Tooney. So it's good that we had the inf uh, Mark walking through his father's history particularly as it relates to the battles with the churches, uh, which is a sad thing. And it brings us back, really, to this uh, page 32 that I was quoting from earlier in the third volume of uh, Institutes of Biblical Law. Boy, I hate when it's mirror reverse, don't you? And I believe we have that passage. thing. Well, I think 
getting some good stuff here. I guess we should go ahead and just put you the context here. Deuteronomy 17, 8 to 12, is important to note that on appeal, priests and Levites are to take part in the proceedings as well as the judges. Because justice is a moral and religious fact, the presence of experts in God's law is a necessity. The meaning of an appeal is gone when justice is not a moral consideration. Because of the Christian impact on the whole world, even Marxist nations have ostensible appellate courts. These, however, are unconcerned with justice, and their function is a facade whereby the form is observed and the substance gutted. In Luke 18.3, we read of a helpless widow's cry to a judge, Avenge me of mine adversary. This is a cry resounding over the centuries in millions of voices. Even worse, churches which should uphold the sovereign and triune God and his law deny that law. By doing so, they have joined the unjust judge and are adversaries of Jesus Christ. Another profound statement there. And that's, uh, that's we have a problem with that. Right, this is the point that's going to actually on page 31. The review of appellate courts in church and state rests on a peculiar premise. First, by refusing to examine a case as to whether or not injustice prevailed, the courts of appeal assume the infallibility of the lowest court. Second, by accepting a case on appeal, they assume that a procedural mistake occurred. How can a decision be immune to appeal on the grounds of injustice and yet subject to retrial on procedural grounds? Often the procedural grounds involve trifles, nothing related to justice. Such a state of affairs is only possible when justice is no longer essential and only the dignity of the court matters. And we seem to see this a lot in the church courts. And I've seen some cases, which I've been privy to, which are uh, particularly egregious in this regard. Uh, we were called uh, to take a look at a church case, and what I was seeing was a disaster, <laughs> was a, uh, a disaster on the moral front where the law of God was misapplied. And so justice was not being done. But the only point that the church says, no, 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 you're not allowed to uh, re-adjudicate this. It's a done deal. Uh, there is no appeal and unless you have a procedural question. So again, if the policy was followed, super. But uh, uh, if the policy was not followed, that's the only way to attack it. And of course, there's a time and place where you won't have the jot and tittle, the, law, the, the procedural justice and substantive justice work together hand in hand. This is a scriptural position that they ought to coordinate at all times. But when they mismatch like this, we have a problem. Jesus used procedural justice, a failure there, to exonerate the woman taken in adultery. So it has its, it's an important part to play, but it's not the sole total of the law of God. It, it's, a, it's a whole, so it's a, a seamless fabric, as Roshani would say. Yes, we'll prepare that for next week about the police. Uh, we actually had quite a few subjects. There were four questions, Philip, that were, we started at the beginning that came in online uh, or through other means. Uh, and uh, then we took several that were floating through the Internet here. Insurance, car, house, and health. So th th that has to do with the sharing of risk what insurance is. And so there's some interesting discussions that have been had on these points. I think uh, bon Bonson's uh, newsletter, uh, the antithesis, uh, had some discussion on this point. So we'll, we'll go ahead and take shelve that till next week, and I'll go ahead and we'll deal with the Nashville statement, we'll deal with insurance, and we'll deal with police again. Again, I did start already with the issue that there should be no immunities for anybody because all are supposed to be equal under the law. There was no such thing in a biblical law as someone who had more rights than someone else. You shall have one law for yourself and for the stranger. One law. And because you have one lawgiver. And so whenever you depart from this process, <coughs> you are subsidizing tyranny in your system. And there's no justification for it. Here in Texas, they made it a law yeah, it's now a hate crime if uh, an officer of the law, a law enforcement officer, a phrase they don't like to hear, they want to call him a peace officer, which becomes ironic in certain situations, uh, that it becomes a hate crime, so we have higher penalties for them than if they kill someone else uh, or harm someone else. So this 
these discriminations within the law uh, are not biblical. Under biblical law, everyone run, operates under the same rule set, and you have full liability for your actions. You don't have either limited liability, as we mentioned, with corporations seek, or an infinite liability as doctors have inflicted upon them, that they have to be perfect at all times or they're in big trouble with us. So we'll hit all those topics next week when I'm fresh and have a chance to uh, get my a couple of resources together. I think it'll be helpful to you folks uh, for me to bring to bear on these uh, topics. Any final comments at this point? Uh, this might be one of our shorter potentially shorter uh, lessons, or Q&A is not really a lesson. Com becomes a lesson when I decide to get my teeth into something and start talking about it. But the intention is simply to uh, answer the questions. And if we're short, short on questions, I might pontificate. See, Right, and it's always, if you can think of a question in the meantime, send it in to um, ask.calcedon at calcedon.edu. It'll come to me. Uh, usually with enough time for me to take a look at it, and I'll either say I can do that in my sleep, or I'll say I better check a source real quick here, just so that I, I don't talk through my hat. If I don't know an answer, I'll say so, and I'll, or I'll at least say I know who that might, and we can go take a look at how we can apply these things. In the course of our discussion today, I've said we need some to do some work on extending the concept, not restricting, but extending the concept of the cities of refuge, because there's so many other ways in which innocent blood is being shed where we can intervene and become a refuge and a covert in the storm, which is uh, spoken of in uh, Isaiah 32. And that's where we want to get to that point, where we are all become that individual city of refuge. That's kind of what the point is of the passage in Isaiah 32, and it's worth studying that. Uh, in fact, as long as we're still running, I guess we're not running. Okay, as long as we're quitting, we'll leave that thought to next week, and I'll um, open with the discussion of that passage in Isaiah 32, which talks about our individual ob obligation to become a refuge and a covert from harm. Till next week, we'll catch you next time. Yeah, we will also talk about next week, Warfield's view of the law versus Bunsen's. Interesting uh, collision between two, two post-mill theonomists, uh, and the reason why they collide is also interesting. It involves eschatology. So, till next week. See you next week.